the lobby, if you can start heading this way, bring your coffee in. It's awesome. It's great to have you guys all this morning. Um, I don't know about you, but the sunshine makes me feel very amazing this morning. <laughs> Um, but even coming out of the weeks that we've had, I don't know what kind of weeks you guys have all had, um, if it's been hard or if it's been amazing or great. I know there's a range of emotions as we walk in here this morning, but um, just wanted to remind you that you are not alone as you're here this morning, as you come in, as you come in with your problems and the things that are weighing on you, if you just look beside you, like take a second and just look beside you or look behind you. That person has problems too. I don't know if you wanna say that to them, you have problems too, but, but just looking and just seeing somebody else, <laughs> I feel a lot of joy happening right now. Um, and just seeing that other people are walking through, through their entire life as well, the joys and the pain, and we get to walk alongside each other this morning. I think that's just such a beautiful thing. And um, just want to just encourage you to to uh, walk forward in that knowing that you're walking beside others. And I just felt like reading this word from Isaiah over you, for some of you this morning, I just felt like that there is something in this for you. It says, but now, O oh Jacob, and maybe your name is Jacob this morning, I don't know. It says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up, the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you. And just as we walk into this morning, I just, um, to walk into joy, to walk into, you know, we can come in and we wanna worship God and we wanna praise him, but sometimes we just get so stuck in, in all of the hard and all of the hard things that we've gone through this week. And so I just want to remind you that that I will go with you is what God says. I will go through the deep waters. I'm the one that's going through all that with you. And because I am, you can. You can praise me. You can actually choose in this moment like I actually, yes, I have something to give this morning and I, I am going to praise, and my circumstances maybe don't look like it, but I am gonna praise this morning. So I just wanna pray that over you guys, and maybe get you guys to stand up as we just go into worship here. So Father, I just wanna pray a release over our church this morning, over our family, a release of just a freedom to just, to just go where you're calling us to this morning and to to worship you fully, to worship you fully, God. And so I just release that over us this morning in Jesus' name.
church do this take? I'll get louder. Then I could just explode and be like, be like, what did you know? Can you say that in church? I could just explode. And that's something that Asher would say. That's something that the kids in the room would say. Like, I'm so happy I can
wonder if we can do something right now. And that is, can we just thank the Lord for something that he's done in our lives? Maybe it was today. I want the kids to do this too. Think of something that Jesus has done for you this week. Maybe it was last week. Just go there. Just go there. Jesus, help us to remember because sometimes we forget something that you have done for us because you deserve the glory. Now, I want you to just turn that into a thankful prayer or a thankful song, whatever you prefer. What he has done for you, big or little, let's just turn that into a prayer of thanks. Yes, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, just for opening doors. Thank you, God, for opening doors, Jesus. You are the door where you have opened doors, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you have I just want us to do something else. That was really good. That was really good. Let's just take a quiet moment, just a real quiet moment before the Lord. And we've been just pushing this praise. We've been singing high praise to Jesus. But guess what? He wants to say something to you. I really felt that as I was praying about this this morning. He wants to drop something into your heart whether you are two or a hundred. Let's just take a moment. He wants to say something to you now. Just take a quiet moment. Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. He wants to speak to us. Maybe you received a picture. Maybe you received a verse. Maybe he spoke a word into your thankfulness. Or maybe he's speaking a word into your week. Let's just spend another minute. Let's spend another minute just listening to Jesus. A lot of times it's the first thing he drops into your heart. received something from Jesus just now, can I just see you? I'm not going to ask you to do anything, but raise your hand. If you felt like God dropped something into your heart, showed you a picture, maybe it was a verse, encouraging one word, can you put up your hand? Okay. Okay. About half of us. We're going to do this again. Those that received a word... I want you to begin to pray for the others in this room that didn't have um, feel like they had a picture from Jesus. Those that did, and we're going to spend a minute again just listening for God's voice in our lives. Maybe it was just a hint or a whiff of something. Hang on to that. Jesus, we are listening. We are your sheep. Hmm. I feel like the Lord is giving some of you words of guidance going into your situations, whatever you're facing. I feel like the Lord is reminding some of you of his promise to you. 
and maybe you haven't seen that promise fulfilled yet. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are good, God. Mm. Put up your hand if you've received something from the Lord this morning. Okay. Okay. Even some of the children. Sometimes we just need to have childlike faith that it's him speaking. Hmm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are a good, good God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. kids from 12 and under heard Jesus speak yeah okay that's awesome Jesus loves to speak to the kids you know why because sometimes they just don't question they just run with it so we're talking about child likeness today and I just pray that if Jesus drops something into your heart and it's truth probably Jesus speaking all right so good thank you worship team for just leading us leading us today God is good God is good yeah thank you Jesus I'm gonna invite Vadim up Good morning. Good morning, Evangel. Good morning, all those who are watching us online. We're happy to see you. Um, let's give a, a round of applause to those who are watching us online. Let's, let's welcome them. Yeah, this is all for you guys. And Jimmy and Tiana, who are watching us as well. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, last week we had our AGM um, meeting, annual general meeting, and uh, we've elected uh, new board members, church leadership team members, CLT members, and uh, I, I would like to acknowledge them. Um, uh, it was Wally Miedema. Can you guys stand up? Wally, if you're here. Uh, then Karma Pratt. Yeah. And Shalene Mitchell. Yes. They're amazing. So they're going to be serving on our church leadership team uh, for the next two years, at least. Okay, mark it on your calendars. <clears throat> this Wednesday, which is March 20th, right? March 20th is prayer summit. Turn to your neighbor and, and remind them, this Wednesday, I want to see you at Prayer Summit. 7 p.m., child care is provided for five and under. This is a great time for us to push into prayer. We want to be people of prayer, not just people who talk about prayer or teach about prayer. Easter. Easter is March, March 31st. And on, Easter's, uh, on Easter, we're going to have some uh, baptisms happening, as we normally do. So if you are contemplating to get baptized, uh, talk to one, one of us, or you can fill out a Connect card and say, I'm interested in getting baptized, we'll contact you. And uh, March 24th, uh, not March 17th, March 24th is our baptism class. I probably made a, a mistake last time saying that today is our baptism class. It's not. Um, it's next week, so the week before Easter. All right, so after the service, it's going to be probably in the lobby here, and Logan, uh, our next-gen pastor, is going to be teaching it. Check. Say check if you got it. Empower Retreat, or I should say conference. We're rebranding re it. Empower Conference. Uh, is uh, April 19th to 21st. Um, 
make sure to register online, uh, scan the QR code. You can also register on Facebook, um, but registration is required. The cost of this conference, which is four days long, um, or three days long, is it three? Yeah, it's three days long, um, is $50. And I want to recommend, uh, we started this thing called, uh, what, is, what is it called? I don't know, a bookstore. A uh, bookstore in the back, you've probably seen some books on the spinny thingy, uh, the stand, the bookshelf. Um, so those are the books, they're, they're not random books, okay? One thing you need to know that they are books who either we've read and recommend, or they are the books that uh, allow you to go deeper into some of the things that we're preaching about. So there are books that are aimed at um, showing you some deeper layers of the prayer targets that we're preaching into and praying into. So uh, one of the prayer targets, one of our prayer targets is to be to choose to see the good in everything, right? And you guys heard a sermon series on that. We've been talking about that, how it's important for us to choose to see the good, not just the bad. Um, and so uh, one of the books that we recommend is the book uh, God is Good by Bill Johnson. Um, this book, I, I, I've read it. I've, I've heard the, the, the teaching. And uh, this book is, I, I think, foundational because it all begins with how you view God. You, it's impossible for you to see the good in everything if you, see, if you haven't learned to see God as good. And God does not change, amen? God is good all the time. We all say it, but it needs to get into our hearts. So this is a great resource, um, not the only one, but a great resource to start, uh, to begin to see the good, and it all starts with God. All right, I'm going to let the kids go. So kids, coming up here, we're going to pray for you, and we're going to let you go into the wild. All right. Coming up. Oh, there's more coming. And uh, why don't you guys extend your hands towards them? This is the next generation. And we don't need to wait for them to grow up. They're already growing up. They already have the Holy Spirit in them that is powerful at work, and he's calling them, he's teaching them, he's forming them into a people of God, into the children of God, and they are children. This is something that we're learning, how to be childlike. Jesus, we, as a church, we pray for these precious ones. Um, you love children, and uh, there is a reason why you love children. We love them too. And as, the, as your family, we just bless them, Lord. We say, speak to them. Uh, we say, empower them. We say, shape them and mold them into the people according to your heart. And we bless them for this time of fun and uh, teaching in the Kids City. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can go. You know where. If not, just follow the trail. All right, we gonna. I'm gonna invite Tony here. Uh, we're gonna do something, uh, something special. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that are happening in, around the world. Uh, first, Zambia, then Ukraine, or I shouldn't say first and, and second. It's they're together. Uh, it's one world we're talking about. So, um, so some of you maybe don't know that uh, Tony and I are mentoring pastors around the world, specifically in Zambia and Ukraine. Can we get another mic, if there's a, another mic? Um, Somebody give it up for Joel, give it up for Joel. <laughs> First we had to make a scene. Yeah, we had to make a scene. Okay, let's honor Joel. He's coming with the mic. <laughs> All right, so Tony and I are, are mentoring pastors weekly yep. uh, from Zambia and Ukraine. Between two of us, there's about 50, right? Yep. Uh, you, you mentor more than I do. But uh, it's been an incredible journey. 
just watching the, just, the, okay, so some of you know the, the whole approach to missions, like short-term missions, or when you go to another country, you sow the seed, and then you come back, and you hope that it grows. Uh, that's one approach. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we decided we're going to try something different. And we started pouring into pastors, empowering them, um, and then seeing how their transformed lives, lives transform the people around them. And so it's been amazing, hey? It has. <laughs> we, have <laughs> we haven't rehearsed this. I've decided I'm going to be awkward today. Um, well, I'll just tell you this about Ukraine and Africa. Like, like many of you have been to some of these places where we're mentoring pastors, Western Zambia mostly. And we as a church have had a long-standing relationship with Ukraine. We first entered into a partnership with a church plant in Crimea that lasted for about probably four years, back in 2004, 2005. So it's been an ongoing thing. But I think what started to happen was, as you guys, as you guys are, are aware, like all of our pastoral team is being mentored, and uh, we're discipled every single week. So if we ever tell you you need to be mentored, we're saying we need to be mentored too. And this is something we walk in. So we were actually, Vadim and I were kind of talking about some of these connections we had. Obviously, Vadim has deep, deep connections into, into Ukraine. We thought, why don't we just kind of share the story of what's been going on in our lives? And we just, wouldn't you say, like an immediate like hunger from pastors? Yeah, totally. Well, I remember Oleg, Pastor Oleg from Ukraine, the guy that you kind of know, but hopefully you'll know him better because he's coming. Um, Yes. So he went a few years ago, well, probably four or five years ago, he, when I told him about the church renewal, the whole idea of hearing God's voice, it's something just clicked and uh, something grabbed his heart. And we know that was the Lord. And he was just like, can I, can I, can I learn from you? Can I see what, what that is all about? And so that started the whole uh, journey of meeting weekly and, and just praying together, learning things so that the Lord is teaching and he, listening to his voice. That's been transformational for him and for his church. And now it's spilling out into uh, other pastors uh, who are joining in from different places in Ukraine during the wartime. And so we had connections also in Zambia right? and felt like, why don't we just make this available? We, what we didn't realize that we know now is that 5% of pastors globally have adequate training for what they do, or are even being trained in any way, shape, or form. So when you come along to a group of pastors and say, hey, we can disciple you in this, this very intentional, strategic pathway that's gonna teach you how to connect with Jesus, it's gonna teach you how to walk in character, becoming more like Jesus, it's gonna teach you all about that, and we're gonna show you how to lead, and what you need to do in your church to see renewal happen. When you offer that, there's a huge, they just jump, and so that's what happened. George Bergen and I were in Zambia for, for just seven days. It was a very quick trip. But we had, we had just shared our story enough that there was such a curiosity that then for about eight, eight, to eight months to 12 months, I was getting constantly peppered by the guys that we connected with over there to say, can we, get, can we be a part of this journey? Can we be a part of this journey? But we're like, how, how on earth? I don't know how you do this. Except we thought, well, we'll start using Zoom. And so we, I started using Zoom with a group of pastors. We've now been doing this for, doing this for three years. I, I know them so well. I can understand them when they talk. Wow. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to. At least some of you might not be able to. But we've just developed such a, a cool relationship. And then we've seen the same thing happen in Ukraine. Right. Yeah. And I think it's such a different kind of relationship, right? Uh, it's not just us going for a little bit and then coming back and forgetting and maybe supporting financially. This is this is one on one weekly. You get that connection, the spiritual connection, and 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 speaking into someone's life. And when you go, and we all support financially, uh, the church is there. Uh, when you go, it's, it's such a diff. It's a different dynamic. Uh, it's it's so much deeper, so much thicker. So, I, I love the model that we're using. And uh, it, yeah, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> We're testing it anyway. Yes, we are. Okay. Should we talk about the special yes, opportunity? Let's bring them into, let's, we're going to bring you guys into a giving opportunity around these two, um, these two things that are happening. Do you want to start first? Do you want me to start first? You start first. Okay, so one of the guys that I mentor, they, one of the things we teach them how to do is to use the tools that we use in our church. So how many of you have taken the set-free set free retreat? 
Yeah, tons of you. Yeah. It's been a huge part of our journey. And um, we do this every year. It's a, it's a retreat that's designed to help people walk in freedom and get free of those things that are just holding us back from our walk with God and his, his mission for our lives. And so we, one of the things we did, Sarah and I did last year, was, was several set free retreats in different locations in Zimbabwe, um, Zambia. And so they saw it modeled, and so now they're doing it. So this week, one of, or actually not this week, it's at the end of the month, one of the guys that I mentor is going to be hosting a set free retreat for 30 pastors and leaders. And so he, so he was just letting me in on it and, and basically just saying, here's what I'm doing. Can you look over my plan? And I looked over his plan and I realized, well, I had, I had two revelations. First, the first one was he needed to feed these guys because they're coming. This is very, very rural. This is not, this is not, uh, this is not Lusaka or, or Kampala or anything like this. This is not Johannesburg. This is like in the bush. These guys live in mud huts, literally dirt floors. <laughs> And so when they, when they walk, you know, 30 or 40 kilometers to get to the place where they're doing the retreat, they stay there. They'll be sleeping on a dirt floor in the church, and they need food. And so he had a list of the plan for food right down to, like, how much canola oil they needed. Well, it's not canola oil. I think it's corn oil over there. And um, that was the first thing that I noticed, and they're not feeding them a lot. They're going to be in they're – gonna, they're going to – of course, they have to spread their, their set-free retreat into six days, which – if you know the culture over there, that's not one single bit surprising. We're like, we got to be in and out. 18 hours, we're going to lose people. Over there, it's like, it has to be six days or more for it to have meaning. Um, and so and when, you, when you see their grocery list, you'll be like, that's crazy. That's all they're feeding people for six days. It's like one fish per person, and then they'll have one chicken leg per person. Like he had itemized that detail. And the second thing I, didn't, I, I, I began to understand, but the news just doesn't carry stuff that's would be good to know about. I mean, I didn't say that. Did I say that? Okay. It's just full of so much garbage. And they don't really tell you the stuff that's going on in the world. Well, Zambia has, an, has, has a national emergency because they have such a severe drought going on over there that's very, very dire. They're in their wet season, and, and they don't get another season coming around until next year. So there's a huge amount of time ahead of them where they just don't have food. And so if you have a government job, you get taken care of in Zambia. If you don't have a government job, what they call a civil servant, then you're on your own. And so, so that was the other thing. So, so I was talking, Vadim and I were talking, and we were like, man, it would be kind of cool if we could just get behind them and cover the cost of that set free retreat. It's about 650 bucks um, for food for 30 How pastors. many people? 30? 30 pastors? That's what their budget is. 30 pastors, six days, all meals in, 600 bucks. Which that's not like you and I eat, <laughs> just to be. 100% clear about this. Um, and so I, I told him, I said, you know, I think we can help you out with that. And so that's one opportunity. We wouldn't mind pushing it a little over 600 bucks just to kind of help the pastor and put food on his own table. That's one piece of this. There's a second part. The second piece already mentioned, Oleg and Tanya are coming, and I'm saying it in faith, because they got their visas. They did. Now they need, we need to bring them here which means we need to get enough funds to buy their flights, really. And, and, and some maybe, as they're here, are they going to stay with us, maybe with um, me and, and Mary? Um, but on, on, for all, really, what we're looking for is about $5,000. Um, that would cover the costs. Of everything. Of everything, yeah. And we would do air miles. Yes, if, if there is anyone yeah. who has air miles, um, that would actually help because the, 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 the most expensive thing out of that is, are the flights. It's around $1,400 per flight, a round trip. Yeah, that's good. That's it? That yeah, good? that's it. So how can we give? Oh, oh we, have a, we have a special way for you. Can we put a slide? Um, so... We, you can give, this is, this, if, you, if we're going to do this in the moment. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to listen to Jesus. We, do, we always do this. We're not. <laughs> um, listen to Jesus and ask him this question. Jesus, do you want me to give to one of these? And how much? That's it. That's all I want you to ask. And if he prompts you, that we have this option called text to give. So if you text the word love to this number, 833-735-0592. It will take you to 
uh, it'll, it'll send you a link to a form, giving form, which is super easy. And Tony, have, have you done it? I'm doing it right now. Oh, he's doing it right now. Are you going to watch me? Do I, I don't know. It's my private business plan. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll do it too. By the way, there is um, there is an option you can give uh, uh, using Visa. There's also an option using uh, Apple Pay. How many of you are using Apple Pay? If you if you have your phone connect, no one. Oh, whatever. Am I the only one doing this? Because I'm the only one. Doing I don't know. <laughs> okay, oh. eight three three, eight three three. For those who can't see, I'm gonna say it. Eight three three seven three five zero five nine two. You can actually put this phone number in your contacts. That's going to be a permanent special phone. You can, you can name it as Evangel Giving. And when you go to your con, when an opportunity like this comes up, we're going to be using this phone number for special giving occasions. We call it special love offering. Um, love. Yes, the word love. We're going to redeem the word love offering. Yes. Everyone got it? Uh, okay. Awesome. Um, so ask Jesus if he wants you to give and how much, and uh, we appreciate your generosity. Uh, this would make uh, possible the, the $650 set for retreat for 30 yeah. pastors, and uh, all like and Tanya coming. We're thinking sometime in May, uh, May, middle May. That would be amazing. But it all depends if we get the funds. Yeah, and you can obviously use the giving centers. In fact, I can feel Wanda in my head right now. Wanda's saying, there's fees, there's fees, there's fees. <laughs> right, Wanda? So if you use this method, you can actually cover your own fees, and that would just make Wanda super happy. You can also use the back door. And if there is, like, if you're like, well, well I want to give, like, six grand, and what if I, what, there's going to be way too much. If there is, then we'll just use that all into missions of some kind, and there's always, if you're, you know, there's always tons of need out there. I mean, it's huge. The need is, the need is utterly stagger, staggering, as I'm sure some of you are aware. Okay. How's everybody doing? Okay, I get to preach today. Um, no, so quiet. But somebody would go, oh, good. I know, you're all like, oh, really? Sarah laughed at that. Sarah, you, you're such a fan. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. And... Um, we're going to just look at this, this, this uh, second prayer target, which don't you guys just love these prayer targets, man? I just love this idea of being like focused in prayer over the course of the year. And it's not just, we're not just saying it. We actually really spend time like discerning what God is saying over our house. And so each of those have a, have a lot of meaning. Last week, Jimmy was talking into radical sacrifice. How many of you felt a little bit challenged last week? Just a tad, if you were here last Sunday. Yeah, lots of hands. Man, what a preach. What a preach. What, he just laid it on the line. So the second, the second of four prayer targets is this. I'm reading it. Just make sure I get it right. Redeeming our childlikeness. Redeeming our childlikeness. So one of them is we want to become a presence-focused people. The second, the first one is <laughs> becoming a presence-focused people, redeeming our childlikeness, becoming a people of radical sacrifice. And then the last one, choosing to see the good in everything. Thank you, Logan. It's great. Okay. So we're going to take a look at childlikeness, and we want to look at the passage. There's a passage linked to each of these, and so the passage for this one is Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, which will be fairly well known to most of you. You'll recognize it right away. I just want to make sure I'm on track here. Okay. Do you want to read it together? Everybody stand to your feet. Let's do it. Come on. Let's get you out of the sitting posture for a minute. Are you ready? Um. <laughs> ESV, that's what I know it in. Okay, ready? At that time, some of the disciples came to, hello, don't make me do it by myself, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him, child, 
he put him in the midst of them and said, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Lord, may you bless the fragmented reading of your word. You may sit down. Wow. Wow. Okay. That was awesome. Okay, so you have this story. How many of you guys recognize that as soon as we started reading it? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a really interesting story. I think the chosen picks up on this scene as well. And you have the disciples, they're, coming, they're, they're walking with Jesus. And then they get this great idea to think about, to actually pitch him for positions in heaven. So if it ever crossed your mind, you're in good company. I wonder what my position is going to be up there. And um, they actually wanted to be at the front of the stack. They wanted to be sitting around the, with, you know, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, da, 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 da. And so in this moment, Jesus, he says, it's, it, it, okay, so that's verse one, right? They come to him, who's going to be the greatest? Verse two, and calling a child to him, he put him in the midst of them. You got you to remember, here's a little thing to remember. Verses and chapter divisions aren't in the original manuscripts. So we add those just to help you give it, give, to bring a little bit of reference. And so you see like, sometimes it's a great idea to read a Bible and just completely ignore the headlines, completely ignore the subtitles and the verse and chapter divisions because they, weren't, they were put in there afterwards and for good reason, like it kind of makes sense. But sometimes I don't think they get it quite right. So this is what happens. The disciples come to them and say, hey, who's, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In other gospels, we know there was more going on. They were actually pitching for titles and roles and all of this. And Jesus doesn't even answer them. He just calls a child and puts the child in the midst of them. That's where I think there should be a verse division right there. Because then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn, we're going to get back to the word turn because that's very, very provocative. Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a huge statement that Jesus makes. And I would actually tell you it's actually... It's, if we understand what he's saying here, it's a great reset for us to get us back on course. So he says, unless you turn and become like children. And so you have this thing happens. He calls a child, and he puts him in the midst of them. And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. So I would pause it. Man, I need some water here just a sec. That Jesus actually brought a child into the midst, and then he just let them watch the child for a while. They just all sat around and just observed the child. Yeah, does that change the picture a little bit? Because if you just picture him bringing a child into the midst, and then he just, all the 12 apostles, argh, and Jesus, the Son of God. You know, you picture this child coming in and just being like, eh, eh. you know, like quiet little child, and there's Jesus got his hand on this quiet little timid child who's, you know how kids are when you put them in front of a crowd? You know, you know what I'm talking about? I don't think that's what's happening here at all. I think they were curious about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus is like, let me just illustrate. So he brought a kid into the middle, a little, a little child, and then he just like, he put him in the midst of them. And then, how many of you guys have just watched kids when they're, in, when they're with you and what they do? He was saying, he was, he was giving them a live illustration, just see what kids, just see what they do. Let's just watch. Let's see what happens here. And we don't have a clue what happened at that point. So many things that Jesus did, we just can only imagine what took place at that moment. But something happened because it made an illustration where he was like, unless you turn and become like this. I guarantee you this was not a quivering little child standing beside Jesus with all the 12 apostles like looking down on him. That's not what we're talking about. It's the unbridled, free child in the midst. And we just know, if you have kids in the room, you know, if you can just picture... Just picture this. Just picture like you're, you're hanging out on a Sunday um, or you're out doing something and you're just like, and Jesus is like, hey, just, let's just bring a kid into the mix and just watch what they do and what would they do in those different environments. Well, I'm going to show you a quick little video that captures this to some degree. So what we're going to do, well, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. There are just two. What we're going to do is we're just going to bring a child into the midst of us and watch. Are you ready? Come to the edge of your seat. Everybody come to the edge of your seat. 
Don't slouch. Come to the edge of your seat. Just sit on the edge of your seat and get ready to see something and get ready for the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to some new truth. Woo! Are you ready? Okay, let's play the video now. We could actually put that on repeat and just watch it. I was, uh, this is, this, that video was Salem, and I got Salem's permission. I didn't get Asher's permission. But I got Salem's permission, and she's like, sure, I guess that's okay. And I was standing over here. It was one Sunday where, where Jimmy or Tiana had invited everybody to come to the front, and you, it was just a crowd of people. So I actually had to bring the camera down like this. And I was watching Salem. I only captured, like, whatever that was, like 20 seconds. But she was doing that for the whole worship set. These just beautiful little moves. I saw this morning, I saw a little, a little lady here. Um, who, who owns Sadie? Yes, okay. <laughs> My favorite moment this morning. And I haven't gotten Sadie's permission to tell this story, but I'm sure she'd be fine. She was up here just worshiping, and she's doing beautiful little things with her hands, and then she was doing this little thing with her feet. Right, she was doing this, and then she had her hands up like this, and then she noticed that there was a shadow coming from the lights, and so she started making little shadow animals as she was worshiping. I was just like, "That's so awesome!" A little heart. She had a little heart going on, and then she's like, she's doing things like this. I actually got a picture of it to prove it. It was so cool. I love how worship worship turns into play really fast, and this is good, and it should happen. Okay, that's another thing. Maybe we'll get to it. All right. Okay, so let's just imagine for a second, um, Jesus is, and the reason I like the Asher clip is because I think, to me, it's a very, very cool picture of God, how he wants to be with us. And I don't know if he realized, if he saw that, but Asher's little guitar didn't have any strings because his father, his father needs to get him new strings for his guitar. <laughs> But his strings were just hanging everywhere, and this little guitar is the crappiest little thing that doesn't have any sound. But it doesn't stop him. He's just banging and having the time of his life. And I don't care how sophisticated you think you are. Like sometimes, I, I, in fact, Tyson and I were talking about this this morning, just as we were listening around childlikeness and how that translates into the worship. Sometimes we just think we're so cool and we're all that. I think that little picture of Asher and me is about the best you get, maybe in some ways. <laughs> oh, you didn't like that? I, I didn't mean that doesn't feel bad thing. I just think like, like you're kind of con you're competing against the angels of heaven who sing 24/7, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty," and you think you're going to pick up a guitar and take. We take ourselves too seriously. We need to take ourselves a little less seriously. And the father doesn't get all hung up when he's hanging out with you and you miss a note. The father doesn't get all hung up when you pull out your guitar and it's missing strings. He delights in us. Oh, yeah. And his, his pleasure over your life is just pure, unbridled joy for who you are and who he created you to be. In fact, I think he, he, he wants you to be like that a little bit more than sophisticated, mature, got it all together, 
offering my very best. He wants you to come before him and be free. We sang about that this morning. You can just let go. You can just let go and be yourself in his presence. And he loves that. I wasn't thinking once when I was hanging out with Asher as his grandpa. I wasn't once thinking, oh, I just wish he would just learn how to do a chord. Like even an E minor. Like E minor, just two strings. Piece of, I wish he knew E minor. I'm not thinking like, oh, his strings are broken. I'm not thinking he's slowing down the, the melody line here. I'm in absolute pure joy as I'm watching him. It was a really, really cool moment. Just loved it. And for those that might know Asher, he's, he's just a bopper. Like he just bops to music. From the time he was really little, he just started going. Okay, so let's just think about this for a sec. Jesus is talking to his disciples, who's going to be the greatest, greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus doesn't even answer the question. He just calls a child, put him, puts him in the midst of them. Pause. What do you think? Let's talk. I know normally we're not like having shouting matches in church, but let's talk. What do you think happened from that point on? So let's say, let's say they lingered for 15 minutes there before Jesus said anything. What do you think the child did in the span of 15 minutes? It's a little boy too, by the way. That flavors it just a tad. Okay, I hear he peed on somebody <laughs> from Logan. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So what we're saying is that the, the child in the midst would have actually informed the whole setting to some degree. They might have got down on their knees. They might have all sat down in a circle. Okay, I heard something over here. He would have. And what would he have done with the stick? Yeah? Would be like exploring, digging up things, like finding rocks. Hmm? Yeah, the stick would have definitely become a sword. Can we all agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he probably played. In the presence of Jesus? Interesting thought. He probably talked a lot. That's actually really good. Oh, man, we could sit on this. Okay, I see another hand. Curious. What would he have asked? What would a why question have been at that point? Is there any food? <laughs> Interesting. He, the child would have been his true self. He doesn't know how to put on a show. I mean, kids sometimes will come into a room like this and they'll be proper for a few seconds. But then they forget about proper really fast. And then they're just doing what they're doing. Interesting. Anything else that you think would have been maybe that child as they were watching him, what he would have been like? How he would have acted? Hitting people? Hitting people? Hitting Jesus, maybe. Throwing rocks. Okay, we got throwing rocks. Okay. Okay. Jesus, you think Jesus, there was play going on? Maybe Jesus was involved with it? Which is an interesting thing. A really good listening prayer question. Some of you might think this is weird, but I think it's brilliant. And we've had brilliant, brilliant people. Oh, as we lead people in this, brilliant revelation comes from it. You just say, Jesus, if there was a game you want to play with me, what would it be and why? It's a real fun one. And as it turns out, he's actually pretty quick to answer that because he is a playful God, we think. He's totally into this kind of thing. Okay. You haven't picked up on this yet, but I think it's important to say I always think if I walk like Jesus, and I'm, I walk in the same spirit that he walked on when he walked the earth, I'm talking about, you know, his earthly ministry. I think, um, I think that, one, religious people will not like me. Right? And by religious people, not meaning any of you in this room. But it's people that kind of think they got it all figured out and they got this nice little box and, and this is what Jesus is like and this is what God is like and I can't, it's just this neat little package because Jesus tends to come into those things and blow them up. And so the religious elite, the religious leaders, Sanhedrin, they actually didn't like Jesus at all. They were intent on killing him almost from the beginning of his ministry. 
demons, if I walk like Jesus, demons will fear me. We see this repeatedly. Um, the, 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 the demonic realm just were so afraid of Jesus that even when he would show up on the scene, they would be like, the son of God, get away from us, blah, blah, blah. So he had authority over the demonic realm. They hated him. They were I actually more feared him, is what I would use the word. And then I always think the third category is children will love me. It's a real, it's always been a really good kind of, uh, you could sort of call it a guiding, light, guiding principle for me in my life, is, is that if I'm actually being like Jesus, kids are going to love me because they're drawn to me. And you know there's other stories where, where, the, where the children were pushing in and parents were pushing in to bring their, their kids to Jesus and, G, and the disciples were like, no, he doesn't have time for you. Jesus rebukes the disciples, right? And then he lets the kids come in. And again, we get all religious about that and think, well, he sat down and they sat on his, they, they did this little thing and they all gathered around and were super quiet and then he just laid hands, prayed blessing over them, which he might have done, but I just think you're reading into the text a little bit. Kids wanted to be around Jesus. In fact, I was just talking with somebody before the service and they said, it was Wendy I was talking to. Um, where are you, Wendy? Are you in here somewhere? Oh yeah, there you are. And she said, do you know that when the, the ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face make his face shine upon you. May he be merciful to you and give you. You know, as another prayer, you think it's just a song. It's actually a verse. It was a verse before it was a song. Anyways, just had to throw that in. When it, this is what Wendy's, can you just really quickly say it? Wendy, you're really quick, fast. Okay. You're going to get it right. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, it was that this, this, um, Saying, and I, you know what, to be 100, uh, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that this is how it is interpreted in the Hebrew, but irregardless, the revelation on it was there. And so anyway, they said that this, this uh, phrase that may God cause his face to shine upon you is, resembles when we try to get a child to smile at us. So we're making all these funny faces and we're, you know, we, but what we want, what we're looking for is the response of the smile of that child back to us. And so that's what that phrase apparently means in the Hebrew is that the, you want God's, this shining, that's what God's trying to do. He wants your smile of response back to him. And I, yeah, that was just so cool. I mean, that's unbelievable because in my world, having eight grandkids, you know what it means to make your, I know what it means to make my face shine upon Z, right? And it's not just like proper. Uh, when I want to get Z's attention, how old is Z now? Three, two, two months? Two months, the size of an eight month old baby, yeah. But when I'm like trying to get, I'm, when my face is shining upon Z, it's like, Z, 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 you know, like, I'm like just doing little things, I do a little Gucci goos, and I'm just like in his face, and I'm just making, you know, I'm like making my face shine. <laughs> I'm trying to make it shine as much as I can. Like, it's like, may, may you make his face shine upon him. I'm just like, <gasps> boop, 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 boop. And, and, and I'm now at the point, maybe you guys are too, where he just gives a little crack of a smile, like just the, the, the eyebrow just twinkles a little bit, and you, or the, the edge of his eye, I'm like, whoa! He's laughing and just full of joy right now. I'm making my face to shine upon you. And it was funny because I was just doing this with Z this morning in the prayer room. I'm like just going, Z, Z, Z. Oh, you were holding him, right, at this point? So I came up and I'm like just, wow, you're so, you're so cute. Papa loves you. Papa loves you. Papa loves you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then suddenly I could feel eyes. You know, you just know there's somebody watching you. I don't know why that was funny. but. <laughs> And I can feel eyes. And I look down, and Soren is right here. And he's not watching Sarah or Z. He's looking at me. <laughs> There's something about that. When your face shines, kids are drawn to that. It happens with, 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 with that's happened with Asher a few times, too. I'm like, just, Z, they're trying to get up to you. Work so hard, give him the smile. Some of you are the same way, you know? God, God feels the same way about you. It's like, I try so hard. <laughs> we want to grow into this. Trying so hard to get Z to, Z to smile, little Zealand. And then I just all of a sudden look down at <laughs> Asher, just glowing like a Christmas tree, looking at Papa. 
I think when Jesus plunked down this little child in the midst of them, there's a lot of things that would have been going on. Like we see with our own kids, like we saw with little Sadie this morning, where she just, she's worshiping. Well, that, that's the first thing you need to know. If she came up here, I don't imagine you were forcing her to come up either, probably. You weren't like, hey, get up there. Like, this is the thing to do now. Like, Pastor Logan said, get up to the front. Now you need to go. She just kind of snuck up here on her own. She was attracted. Oh, man, don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. When the child was in the midst of them, I, I, I just, I'll put a guarantee on this, that they would have been irreversibly attracted to Jesus. Not in a religious way, but in the same way you saw... Me, me and uh, Z, your Asher and Papa having that moment, and he's constantly looking at me like, <laughs> like boom, 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 I'm hitting this. <laughs> and then he looks up. But there would have been an irreversible attraction because Jesus is the most attractive person in the universe and not in a churchy kind of way. Kids loved him. Um, women loved him. I always think it's so crazy that Jesus had a whole following of women that loved who he was in this patriarchal society that didn't value women at that point, and yet they were so attracted to him. Like, think about that. Men loved him. The disciples, you know, ancient oil patch workers, tough guys working long hours, they loved Jesus. They were willing to follow, abandoning everything to follow him. And kids, without all that crap that you and I tend to build up over years in a posture of innocence, and they don't have to try to be childlike for most instances, although I'll tell you right now, it's being driven out of them quicker and quicker and quicker. But in their innocence, what do you think they would have done in the presence of this very attractive person who likely got down on their level? They would have been just drawn to him. And I'm just thinking of Sadie this morning, the way she was just drawn. She was singing the words to all these songs. And then she was making little shadow puppets. And then she'd go right back into worship. I just love that. I love that about kids, how they can just and just go from one thing to the next. Okay. Wow. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I just feel like I feel like a lot of us are on the brink of this. And maybe we can feel like the Lord is teasing us into something, but you don't have a frame of reference for it. Because all of your life, you have seen or experienced a religion that is so, it's all about sobriety and being sober. Be quiet in the house of the Lord. Get your coffee cup out of here. <laughs> you just laughed at me like what I said was a joke. It actually happened at one time. Seriously. <laughs> That's so awesome. He goes like this. <laughs> when I talk about coffee cups in church, it's a very painful memory for me that I've had to be freed from, okay? <laughs> but we still have all these, like, these little, these little tag-ons that come from our years and years of trying to figure out how to be a Christian and being immersed in a religious environment that we're still tripping on the edge of that. And we're going, can I really come into this? I'm just telling you, this is the way it was meant to be. I saw, Vadim, I have to go here. Okay. I feel like all I'm doing really is pitching it and setting it up for you next week. You can come in and bring the theology and make sure it's all legal, okay? <laughs> I saw on my um, Facebook reel. Come on, you all do reels. I know you do. Don't try to tell me you don't. And there was two images that there, was, there was one that I've seen. I love grizzly bears. I, I just love grizzly bears. I have from the time I was a kid. I've been fascinated with grizzly bears. And we lived in Bella Coola, the grizzly bear capital of the world, so we had lots of encounters with them, which I had another one this summer that maybe I'll tell you about sometime. It was the scariest encounter of my life. And, and so there's this video that comes up on my Instagram, or not Instagram, it was Facebook Reels. Is that what they're called? Yeah, Okay. And it's one I'd seen before where these guys are in Alaska and they're fishing on this river and all of a sudden from like 200 yards out, this grizzly bear, massive grizzly bear is just charging at them. Just boom, kaboom, just galloping at them. Not to, not to, not to play with them. <laughs> Grizzlies don't play with their dinner. They, they eat it. That's what they're all about. 
And this bear is coming, just running. And it's going through deep, the water's like this. And it's acting like it's going through butter. It's not holding it back at all. And these guys just start hollering. Aah! And as this bear comes in, it just kind of, just kind of arches out in front of them. And it kind of keeps running. But it's, you're just like, oh my goodness. I, I had an encounter with a grizzly bear this summer. I was running. And, and I can just tell you, you don't even stand a chance. Like they move so fast and they're so powerful. And, um, and so that was the one reel. And then I just, if I see bear reels, I just flip up. And the next reel, <laughs> I do. I do this every once in a while. Um, the next reel, there's this, there's this guy that I've been following that, that lives some, somewhere in Siberia, somewhere out there. Huh? Are you talking back to me? And this guy has tamed grizzly bears. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't even believe it if you saw it. And so, the, the, but I'd never seen this reel before. The guy is actually calling the bear. I should have put this on the screen. He's like, here, Fido, here, Fido. In Russian, I can understand what he was saying, but I'm sure that's what he was saying. Fido, come here. And this grizzly bear, I'm talking like a 1,200-pound grizzly bear, just goes, good job. He's just galloping down this trail. Same imagery as the other video. Only they're like, ah, this is awesome. And as the bear gets closer, one of the, one of the ladies in the background goes, and I understood it even though it was Russian. She says, uh-oh. <laughs> the same all across all languages. <laughs> and this bear, like we have a dog, his name is Dakota. And when we come home, Dakota just is bouncing on his feet. And then he kind of does this little bouncing away thing. And then he bounces back in. This is exactly what this grizzly bear was doing. And then he comes in and they put a collar on him. But he, this grizzly, this 1,200 pound grizzly was so excited to see these people. I was like, I thought only, only like little, little tiny grizzlies were like that. Because they're very playful when they're little. But then they grow out of that when they get old. Huh? Think about that. Sarah and I were up in the Sikini one time with our kids. We were quadding back in there. We were way back in, and I'll never, ever forget, about 200 yards down the road, we thought we saw a pack of dogs, only it, was, it, looked, it looked to us like a German shepherd with its pups. And, and we're watching this, and we have it on camera somewhere, because some, we, we zoomed in. Old iPhones back then didn't do as good of a job. And then we realized we were watching wolves. And it was a, it was a female wolf with her pack. And they were just tumbling and playing and having the time of their lives, these puppies. But they lose that when they're older, amen? <laughs> Except it can be redeemed. See, if, if the Lord is inviting us, okay, so, okay, I saw this picture of this grizzly bear just this morning. I was, that's what I was doing in the prayer time. No, I wasn't. It was just before the prayer time. I'm not like some of you heathens that look at your Instagram reels during prayer times. And the Lord brought this to my attention. He said, Tony, that's a picture of redemption. Because the way he created things in the Garden of Eden, I don't know if you knew this or not, but grizzly bears were not enemies there. They were friends. That's one of the things I cannot wait when I think about heaven. I, I have a small belief that they're actually going to talk. I, I hope animals talk like they do in Chronicles of Narnia, but I don't know. But I don't care. They don't need to talk. I just can't wait to have a tussle like I do with my dog, with a grizzly. It's me. Whoa! It's gonna be so cool. But that's what they had in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve just didn't walk around naked and pick fruit. They walked around naked and played with animals and <laughs> picked fruit. That's a bad image. Just get that out of here. I don't know. It came from you. I have a feeling that just came off you like an anointing. Okay. No, they would have had such an incredible relationship with creation. And it wasn't until sin entered the picture, the animals became mean. They stopped talking. And as I was looking at this picture of this grizzly, I realized, oh, that's actually a picture of redemption. Where man actually takes his role as he was intended to, like in, a, in, the, in terms of dominion, which isn't a mean thing. It just means, hey, I'm like making this whole thing flourish. And you see this bear. I, I was like, I didn't think an old grizzly bear could actually become fun like that. But they actually have intrinsic in them also a fun spirit. Not think about weird, fun, like animal spirit or anything. Let's get that out of your head. That's not what I meant. 
why are you laughing at me? <laughs> they, there's something about when you come back to the Garden of Eden that play is unleashed again. Anyways, Jesus says he pulls the child into the midst of him. You can just think about that. Like, how did that child act? And then after an indeterminate period of time, he turns to his disciples and says this. He says, unless you become like that, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't just say, unless you become like that. He says, unless you turn and become like that. Everybody say the word turn. It's this idea that you've been walking along on this trajectory and you passed all these waypoints to get here and Jesus is saying, you actually need to circle back to a waypoint back here. Unless you turn, repent, go backwards to something you had at one point, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is cool. I think this is really cool because it means like a lot of people think that God hates them because he points out things in their lives that need to change. It's not a case of God hates you, therefore you need to change. It's a case of God knows exactly who he created you to be. And he wants to see you restored. Every time the Lord comes into your life and says, look, there's something I want you to confess as sin. I don't care how close it feels to you, how personal it feels to you. This is who I am. But he says, it's not that he's going after that because he hates you and he wants you to change. He just hates the way you are and I want you to change and become more like holy or whatever. He's always inviting us back into the garden, so to speak, into restoration. Oh my goodness. There's a few verses popping around in my head, but I don't think I have time to go into them. We'll let Vadim unpack the theology next week. We turn and become like little children and then he's like, and then you can get in. It's more than just getting into the, a future kingdom. It's actually experiencing the kingdom of heaven now. This fits with a lot of things we've been talking about. And it's a key to getting back in. We have to become like children again. Jimmy said something last week that just rocked me um, when he was preaching. He said, every person has a quarter of a fool in their brain. Do you remember him saying this? Yeah, Merlin's nodding. I remember. You, that, stuck out, that stuck out to me and you, okay? Just the two of us. Every person has a quarter of a fool in their brain. I, I might be misquoting it slightly, but the idea was every one of us have a fool up here and we better learn. Well, here's the problem with the fool. Fools are really loud. You need to know that about the whole public media thing too. The fools are the loudest usually. And I know in my head the fool is loud. He speaks so loudly and his ultimate message is there is no God. Well, as Jimmy said that, and I was thinking about this week, I realized immediately there's also a child inside of you. It's not an unusual term. Shalene, you're counseling. You know, we often talk about the inner child, right? There's this part of you inside that in a lot of ways, we've, we, we've, we're not really sure what's going on there, but we know we need healing to get that, to move into something there of innocence. And I mean, the subwords there on our prayer request are wonder, creativity, innocence, all these things about childlikeness that we know, well, I need healing to go there, and that's true. But without getting into that, here's the point. Here's what Jesus was saying. Well, if you have a quarter of a fool up there, listening to the fool will lead you into a life that lives as though there is no God. And just because you come to church and sing worship songs and listen to preaching and all of this doesn't mean the fool is not leading you. Just take a good look at your life and how it fleshes out the fruit of your life. Are you living as if there's a God or there's not a God? If you're living as if there isn't a God, the fool is probably really loud and you're probably listening to him. But Jesus was also saying, turn back, right? Turn back, think of that. You're going back into something that you already possessed at one point. In other words, there is inside of you a childlike spirit. There is, and I'm not telling you it's going to be easy to find its way into. It may be a huge process of healing, but somewhere at some point in your life, even if you were in a super abusive home and your parents were not models of what God is like with us, I still promise you at some point, you had that. You were that. You walked in innocence, creativity, wonder, and you lost it. And Jesus is saying this, unless you let that part of you into the driver's seat a bit more, you will never experience the kingdom of heaven. 
That's what I've come to think, is that for me, I need to let that part of me that's childlike be in control to some degree. To some degree. I know some of you are thinking, like, I don't want to be childish, and I know there's a difference there. There's a line where it can go from awesome fun to, like, now it's childishness. But I'm saying this. There's something in you of, of being a child, being like Asher was with me, with his papa, that you and I need to recapture if we want to actually experience the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, unless you turn and become like little children, you turn and go back into something, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I'm out of time. Just a couple things really quick. Is this okay, Logan? Two things really quick. Because I feel like I've told you the what, and you're probably going, how, right? Like, I've told you the what, and it's like, okay, I get that. But how, 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 how? Well, just two things, really quick. And this needs to be talked about more. I don't have time to get into it. But worship is one of the most childlike things that I think we can do. So I just gave you a step in right there. If you look at the, if you look at the Psalms, the book of worship in the Bible, and you look at biblical worship, I'm not talking about stinky religious worship, which is what we do in our churches a lot of the time. It's really not biblical worship. It's this mature, stinky, smelly, unattractive thing. That I want to tell you, in all seriousness, the devil is trying to take play out of worship, I think. Song. And people come in and they just go like, what are all these people so sad about? But if you look at biblical worship, okay? This is hardcore biblical worship. You will find, just in the Psalms alone, all of these expressions that we're actually commanded to do. And guess what, guess what the thing about these expressions is? Kids do them naturally. Singing. They just sing. From the time they're very young, they start to sing, almost before they talk. Many times before they talk, they start to sing. They just do. It just flows out of them. You saw it. Did you see that little picture of Asher going, <laughs> Lifted hands is a very childlike expression. But not like these kind of like perfectly lifted hands. I mean, you can do that if you want, okay? Have fun with that. Doing these perfectly square, like a football right here. Come on in, Lord. I want you to score a touchdown here. No, like he did, like, oh. Shouting is another form of worship that's very, very common in scripture. And how many of you have kids, how many times have you had to tell them, hey, keep it down, keep it down. Hey, we're going to church. You need to know that you need to have your inside voice on now. We used to tell our kids that, yeah. They are loud. Dancing. We didn't have to teach Asher how to dance. He just did it. And it was really jerky like this because he was a little bit pudgy. His just rolls would just roll and just tumble. We called him Wubbles. He wrote a song called Wubbles because when he would do this, everything would wubble. Just so wubbly. It's a true story. Watching little Salem up here. I, yeah, okay, okay. Vadim has given her dancing lessons. Okay. And out of the overflow of who Vadim is, it's just a mover and shaker. No, that's not at all. Uh, he's just like the stiffest Ukrainian you've ever met. And the Lord is trying to loosen him up a little bit. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying this, that when we come together as a church and we worship, the expressions are given to us as a thing that we do, a motion that creates something in us. And I believe part of that is a childlikeness. Secondly, and this, I'll get you to stand up. Thanks for the music. Nice. Here's the second thing. Romans chapter eight breaks it down really clear. I'll read it, just to, so, you, so, you know, so you know I'm actually reading the Bible here, okay? I'll read it. Romans chapter 8. I'll read it from the message. Shout out to Jimmy. Romans chapter 8. And maybe as we read this, you could just kind of go into a receiving posture all across the room. By that I mean just, the Lord may want to give you something here. And that's what I'm going to say is, 
is there's some things we can do to step into childlikeness, but the word of God is very clear that the spirit comes along and testifies with our spirit who we really are, children of God. And so that this is actually not just on you, it's on God as well. Jesus takes responsibility over your life to say, I am going to give you the spirit of adoption as sons. It doesn't matter where your background is. It doesn't matter if you don't even know what a child, you can't remember what it means to be childlike because of the the home and the environment you grew up in. You didn't even know what it was like to play. Well, God says, well, I'm adopting you. (laughs) And my spirit is gonna bear witness with your spirit about who you really are. Okay, now I gotta find the verse. Okay, just stay in a receiving mode. Seriously, stay there. <sighs> hmm. Okay. Verse 15, Romans chapter 8. This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave tending life. I love that. It's not that. It's adventurously expectant. Oh, come on. Holy Spirit, we just released that in the room right now. Adventurous expectation. God, every person in this room, as they're in a receiving posture before you, we just release a spirit of adventurous expectation. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what? what's next, Papa? God's spirit, this this is what I want you to hear. God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. Who you really are. Again, regardless of your background and your journey and how difficult it's been and how far you feel like you are from this, this is actually who you really are. And God is inviting you to come back to something. That's why Jesus said, unless you turn and become like children. Who we really are. So hear this again. In a, in a spirit of receiving, just receive it right now. God's spirit touches our spirits. We just ask for that to happen right around the room right now, that your spirit would touch our spirit right now. God's spirit touches our spirit and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are. Father and children. Oh, and we know we're gonna get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. The Spirit himself testifies with your spirit who you really are. I don't really think we can actually go back into this on our own. We can go through all the actions, all the motions. In fact, maybe some of you have been. You've just been trying so hard. You've just been pushing into this. But your laughter is empty and your play looks like you're, you're, you're not really, your heart's not there. And the spirit says, I'm going to confirm who you really are. And he comes along and he touches our spirit and he, and he actually comes as Abba, Father, Daddy, God. And he releases something on us. Okay, Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in the room right now. If you're in a, a receiving posture, Something is stirred in us that we want. I I feel as if we're on the edge of something, even as a community here, an invitation to stumble into joy. Yeah, joy, joy, adventure, hope, Mm, delight. And so right where we're at right now, Jesus, we just welcome your spirit to touch us come and reach in right through all the garbage and baggage and pain and disappointment and and load and labor and burden that we've been carrying. Just reach right through all of that. All the stories that have made us who we are today. Reach right into our heart and just do what you say you do. Your spirit touching our spirit, confirming, speaking, releasing who we are children with their father. Yeah. Do we have a ministry team? We do? Okay. So stay standing. Um, If you need to slip out, that's totally fine. But I would encourage us to kind of linger here just for a minute. I know we're sitting on 12. But we're going to have a ministry team up here. You don't have to walk this on your own. 
and they know what we're praying, so they're gonna be releasing just the childlike spirit on you. I don't think you need to leave here the same as you came in. Um, and so, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together. Ministry team, you guys can just kind of find your way up here. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together, to worship and love on you in a, what I would call a very childlike manner, and now to be invited into something deeper in this childlikeness. That Jesus, you said you can't even get into the kingdom of heaven unless you walk this way. This applies to every single one of us. Now we just say, help us. Help us by your spirit. And Lord, for the, as we go out to the rest of our day here, I pray your blessing would rest on us heavily. And that Lord, you would, you would kind of maybe haunt us a little bit with this one. May we have in our minds the picture of the child in the midst of them, the disciples in Jesus and think, I want to be like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need to go, that's totally fine. We bless you guys. If you want ministry, we have a team up here. We have hands raised. And it's Your heart is strong.